I was just waiting for my allotted uh, time. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome again to Sep Days in uh, beautiful Vancouver. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I love the city. My name's Olaf, and I have the privilege of walking you guys through, you fine folk, through some of the basics of Ceph, or as the session title was pitched, a beginner's guide. This will very much be a bird's eye view of Ceph, hitting on some of the who's, where's, and why's. I'll be leaving all the hows to my esteemed colleagues speaking throughout the rest of the day as they go into deeper detail about Ceph. So, um, personally, I sometimes have a hard time expressing what I know in wor into words, so I like to have explicit definitions of like keywords, topics, subjects that I can memorize, regurgitate at will, to, like help get uh, conversations and ideas flowing. Um, and I had intended uh, for a lot of that to be included in this talk. But as it turns out, unfortunately, not all concepts are so easily boiled down to a dictionary definition. Some of the things I'll be talking about uh, are easier to describe by what they do as opposed to what they are. But that'll be, that'll be a, bit more apparent, a bit more apparent as we go along. So let's get started. And start out at the beginning of our beginner's guide. So where did Seth come from? Seth was originally developed by a gentleman by the name of Sage Weil back in 2003 as part of his PhD project at the University of California in Santa Cruz. So this first uh, iteration only implemented the Ceph file system. So later in 2006, it was, Ceph was open sourced under the lesser GNU public license. And in the following years, various institutions, companies, especially other developers, further helped support development of Ceph and in 2012, the same Mr. Weil was, was able to found Ink Tank, a company that sold support for Ceph. And in 2014, some crazy company called Red Hat acquired Ink Tank. And here we are. Oof. What's in a name? So what does, uh, what does Ceph mean? It's a, li it's a little known uh, story that uh, Mr. Weil was an avid fan of 1980s uh, Steven Spielberg movies. But he was so busy writing Seth that he never had enough time to watch the movies to the end. He only got about halfway through and had to get back to work. So all the time he's working away on Seth, it's bugging him in the back of his head it's so much that it, 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 he wants to know, can E.T. phone home? So he takes that sentence and takes the letters and makes Seth out of it. That is a complete lie and fabrication. <laughs> um, Ceph is not an acronym at all. It doesn't stand for anything. Ceph is actually short for cephalopod. Um, so yes, this is our, our first dictionary definition of the day. Uh, a cephalopod is any of the marine animals belonging to the cephalopoda class of mollusks. That includes squids, as well as an oct octopi, octopuses, however you say that. Um, and as well as banana slugs, banana slugs, Shouldn't be important, you wouldn't think, but as it turns out, banana slugs are the, according to the internet, the mascot of the University of California in Santa Cruz. So I guess this was a naming convention to keep everything in the family. <laughs> um, but in my search for a uh, definition for Ceph, uh, you know, I found many um, descriptions of Ceph. Some were more helpful than others, like, um, yeah, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but uh, eventually I found my perfect dictionary definition. And that is, it was from uh, an author named Nick Fist. Ceph is an open source, distributed, scaled out, software defined storage system that can provide block, cluster, and file storage. I well, fell in love with this. It's perfect. Um, not only does it say what Ceph is, it says what Ceph does. I think that's. Uh, important because those last, um, those last three things were uh, broken out, block cluster and file storage. Most of the other descriptors were calling Ceph unified, which it surely is, but I think that you know, uh, the exact definition of, <laughs> definition again, what it, uh, unified can mean different things to different people. Um, you know, uh, someone might consider SAN and NAS access from the same uh, node as unified, but um, 
yeah. Anyway, that's, um, let's break down this definition just a bit. Uh, open source, I'm sure everyone here knows what open source is and a big fan of it as that's what we do. The um, distributed scaled out just means it's over lots of, uh, you know, <laughs> lots of lots of nodes. It could be as big as an entire data center or as small as a. Uh, you can't. I guess you can install it on a single node. Software defined storage is uh, another um, thing that we will uh, define here shortly, but. Um, like I say, I wanted to highlight the whole point of not just what Ceph is, but what Ceph does. These last three, block, cluster, and file storage are the, serv the three services that Ceph exposes to users. And we'll see about that in a bit. All right, so um, software, software defined storage. So software is in the definition. What's software? I think um, <laughs> it's a bit too silly to try to define, but um, so software uh, these days has a release cycle. That's uh, this is Ceph's release schedule here. Quincy and Pacific are the two active releases at the moment. Uh, I didn't bother listing out every single release. I just wanted to show how in Infernalis how the package, ver package versioning numbering changed. So starting then, the, the first number of the release version is also that letter of the alphabet, as in... 10 is, or J is the 10th letter of the alphabet, K11, uh, maybe like a, maybe that's uh, obvious to you guys. Uh, it took me a while to figure that out. Um, so here's, um, here's some more of our definitions, software-defined storage, a system of extracting data storage so that the provisioning and management of storage are separated from the underlying hardware. And we'll see in just a minute how, um, in a diagram, it, well, it's, pretty obvious too, the, the services that Ceph uh, exposes aren't, don't talk to hardware at all. Um, I usually wouldn't quote Wikipedia, but um, uh, this is uh, the second one's from them. I just thought it was pretty jaded for Wikipedia. So software-defined storage is apparently just a marketing term for computer data storage software, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, that's 11. Once I got, well, yeah. As I mentioned, so the whole dictionary definition thing doesn't work too well sometimes. And once I got into trying to describe or define file, block, and object storage, um, yeah, some of the definitions were a little bit less than useful. Like, for example, a method of organizing and retrieving files from a storage medium. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> not particularly helpful. But so, uh, you know, a file, file system, file storage should be one of the most um, familiar ways of storage, of storage um, that users are familiar with. Um, I couldn't find a uh, agreement on what the first file system might have been, but file systems have been around at least since the 60s. Um, you know, they're everywhere. Every computer in here is using one. My, this, my presentation is a file. Um, so file storage, file system, and file storage is uh, you know essentially just hierarchical. You're making directories and putting files in directories, and the user gets to set those up. Um, none, of the, none of those files are stored contiguously; uh, they're all chopped up, um, much like uh, our next definition, block storage. But um, yeah, popular file systems are FAT32, NTFS, um, and so in Ceph. The file system service is called Ceph FS or Ceph file system. Block storage uh, is when the data is split into fixed blocks of data and then stored separately in unique <coughs> identifiers. Lovely bland definitions that uh, I'm sure you guys can read for yourself. <laughs> I won't bore you with them, but yeah. So block storage has a pretty uh, adept, I don't know if adept is the right word, a pretty descriptive name and that's, uh, that's kind of what you get with block storage. You get a big chunk of data that, once again, isn't contiguous. Um, with block storage, you know, you uh, examples being SANS or iSCSI disks, even a local disk, it's a, you know, a thing that stores data, but it's pretty useless as and of itself. It's got to be attached to an OS or a, you know, a VM or something somewhere um, that describes where all the data is stored on those in that uh, bad boy. Object storage, on the other hand, 
And here's another one of those terrible definitions. A system that divides data into separate self-contained means that are restored in a flat environment with all objects on the same level. Well, that's not too terribly unuseful, but um, it just, that being the opposite of a file system, everything's just stored flat. It's all in one big place. There's the identifier that's given so that it can be collected later or retrieved later. Good uses of object storage, or I don't know about good, but, um, <laughs> How it gets used is for things like uh, collections of music, organ unorganized data, music files, video files. They're, they're available over RESTful servers or HTTP. Most pe pe people, uh, you know, while not as old as file systems, um, you know, object storage has certainly been around thanks for a while, thanks to S3 and of course Swift. In Ceph, that service is called is provided by the Radius Gateway, and I think I skipped what that's called in. Block storage, we'll get to that in a second. Here's our architecture diagram. So Ray, the Rados Gateway is our object storage service. RBD is the Rados block driver, so our block storage, and CFFS is our file system. And these uh, are all sitting on top of Rados. So uh, yeah, get that out of the way. Those are the three services exposed to the user. That's a um, what Ceph does, now we want to talk about the back end of Ceph for a second. Starting with Rados. Rados stands for the Reliable Autonomous Distributed Object Store, which is uh, quite a mouthful. I'm glad it got uh, concatenated to Rados. It's the underlying or core storage layer for Ceph, uh, which is it, is, it is object storage, which can uh, be, very, very useful. Um, and uh, so Rados is made up of, uh, you know, one, two, about as many um, OSDs as, as is needed. Uh, we'll get into that definition just shortly. But Rados works together with CRUSH. CRUSH stands for Control Replication Under Scalable Housing. So while Rados is, you know, essentially all the storage, it is Ceph, you know, or what Ceph is relying on. Crush is an algorithm. It's a pseudo-random placement algorithm. And the, the quote I have here is from, uh, again, our, mis our Mr. Weil. Crush is the magic that figures out where all the data in the system should go. And everyone can repeat this calculation and know where to read or write data. So the, what makes Rados and Crush a bit special is that um, usually when data gets chopped up and placed all over disk drives or servers or whatever, there's a lookup table so that that data can be um, re reconstituted. Um, the difference with Crush and, and Rados is that there is no lookup table. Uh, there's no body in charge of keeping track of where everything is. There's no master node like in some other file systems that we'll see shortly. There is Crush. It crushes an algorithm, so it takes the name of the object along with uh, a way of describing um, all the disks that are in the system and it calculates where that data should go so that nobody, none of the other nodes in a, in a radar system, you know, like I say, don't, they don't need to talk to the, uh, talk to a service or a, a master list of where all the data is. They can calculate where that data is, which um, is extremely helpful when the, uh, uh, replication is needed and things go down and you want to add servers and that kind of thing. I believe that's a, a topic later on today. Um, I promised the definition for OSDs. Uh, these are the object storage demons. These are the workhorses of Ceph. So these are the things running on all the nodes that actually do the storage. That's a, a gross oversimplification, but uh, I, I did promise you a bird's eye view. <laughs> uh, I'm skipping over uh, other back in parts of Ceph, namely the monitors and the Brados. That was, I don't know if you remember the architecture diagram, that was the skinny little blue part. That's the, the library um, that lets applications talk to Rados. In favor of moving on to our next topic, whether your mom should download Ceph or not. So they, um, a couple of years ago, uh, or several years ago, a good friend of mine who was a, a pro, uh, I don't know if prolific is the right word, but he was a regular contributor to more than one um, OpenStack project. Uh, it was uh, relating the story of having, of trying to tell his, relate to his parents what he did for a living. Um, to which his mom responded, what is this OpenStack stuff? Should I download it? 
which I thought was hilarious because one, I know his mom, and two, I could just see her on her phone trying to download OpenStack, which I mean, good luck to her. So yeah, um, so I, so it's probably a safe bet that none of our moms no need to download Ceph, but who should? Um, pretty much anybody that's looking to looking for storage. Um, some of the, but the, the most obvious use case for Ceph is OpenStack. The OpenStack uh, Cinder block driver can use uh, Ceph's Rados block driver, as well as Manila can use um, the Ceph file system. Um, I think the last statistic I read was that, you know, over half of all OpenStack implementations already use Ceph, so that's, um, it's, a, it's a great partnership. Uh, but any of those three uh, services that we talked about, uh, Ceph would make a great use case for standing on its own. Uh, it certainly excels in object storage because the underlying data uh, you know, storage layer, Rados, is object storage. But you could also use it as, uh, and you don't want to set up a uh, NFS file share for all your web servers to use. You could, uh, you could certainly use the uh, Ceph file system as a distributed file system. Or, yes, Block is certainly available. And clearly, there are plenty of people needing storage because there are loads of other storage solutions out there. I wanted to uh, compare and contrast just a few real quick. One is, uh, the first one uh, I've got listed is Storage Scale, which used to be known as Spectrum Scale, which used to be known as GPFS, which stands for Global Parallel File System. This was a highly performance clustered file system. It has been around since the late 1990s, or released by IBM. I think most people's um, uh, you know, um, dislike for it would be that it is not open source. The rest of these are open source. And all of these, uh, I think they're, anybody who runs Ceph would say that they're um, the lack of all three available types of storage from these guys are, you know, to their detriment or what, what makes them less appealing. Um, Gluster is another network catal fetch file system. Oh, back to storage scale. I have heard rumors that you can make storage scale perform better than Ceph, but uh, I haven't done run those tests myself and uh, hope to report on that uh, at a later meetup if that's uh, actually the case. Uh, Gluster, was bought by Red Hat in 2001. It will, it is at the, out of the box. It's just a file system, but you there are supposedly plugins that will let you uh, get some kind of um, block access to Gluster. Luster and HDFS both have a bottleneck problems in that, uh, like I was telling you about how Rados and Crush, uh, you know, get to calculate where storage should be. These guys both either try to keep all that that master list of where all the data is on a single server, which single point of failure, you know, never a great idea, or you know, more than one name node. When it's obviously a lot uh, more robust when every single node knows where the data goes in a in a system. Uh, our last question for uh, for our bird's eye view is. How do you install Ceph? There are uh, there is a official deploy tool called Ceph Deploy, which um, you know Ceph uh, updates or maintains. There are plenty of or orchestration tools are very uh, popular, and I wouldn't purport to try to uh, define them here. Uh, but Ansible, of course, is uh, uh, Red Hat's uh, also owned by Red Hat, so they're somebody else that they like to use their favorite child, I guess. <laughs> But Ceph Ansible is pretty famous, pretty popular. But any of the other orchestration engines, Puppet, Chef, Salt, they all have um, they all have Ceph modules, and you can install them with that. There is, and of course, there's Rook. Rook uses Kubernetes, and this is actually a pretty good place for me to stop because I believe the actual next uh, session is on Rook. So yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Tip your waitresses. <laughs>